Mm -hmm. Mr. Kevin Trierweiler here. We'll, uh, we'll be sharing a story with you about his uh, journey through the MAC program, through uh, how he's tried to implement uh, transformative practices throughout this year, uh, how he came to teaching, uh, some highlights from his practice over the course of the year, and some reflections on what he's learned. Um, he'll present for 15 minutes, um, and uh, there will be a total of five minutes for a little Q&A session at the end. Um, sec secondary MAC colleagues, remember to uh, complete the feedback form that you uh, should have in front of you. And uh, audience know that the uh, session is being recorded, as you can see with the, uh, the trash can. Use of technology. Using technology. All right. Um, so everyone, um, before beginning, I would just like to thank everyone for coming. Um, I did not expect this large of a crowd. <laughs> so thank you guys. Um, thank you. I really appreciate um, you guys taking time um, out of your day to come here. Um, also, as I'm not used to uh, as I'm used to speaking in front of children, um, please <laughs> forgive my use of reading more from my notes. Um, so, what does it mean to be a transformative teacher? Also, pedagogical means kind of the study of teaching. Those are the terms. Anyway, so what does it mean to be a transformative teacher? Uh, to transform how we teach, we must know the current state of uh, affair of. Uh, Sorry, the current state of affairs of our educational system and how it privileges certain groups over other groups. Um, too often it is teacher-centered. Uh, the knowledge flows from the teacher to the students, a la another brick in the wall for those familiar with Pink Floyd. So I firmly believe a quality education that encourages critical and reflective thought, um, that pushes students to truly question the world around them, ensuring all students um, have equitable access to superior education is paramount to helping both our students and our society. But let's take a step back before getting into my teaching experience. Um, I thought I knew what the average student was like, um, how students were motivated to achieve in school um, kind of more intrinsically. Um, but as I began my teaching um, at the public um, Scarlet Middle School and the public um, John Glenn High School, uh, in Westland, I realized my frame of reference was radically skewed. My mistake, which I continually fight to this day, is that I was the typical student. Um, and to, to this day, I have to remind myself that not everyone will read ahead <laughs> or do the reading. <laughs> you know, that might not be the norm. Um, <laughs> or even be passionate about the subjects that, you know, we are interested in. So to kind of motivate students to be passionate about that um, is what I have tried to strive to achieve. Um, so realizing that not every student was like that, in fact, a very large number of students were like that, was a proverbial uh, splash of ice cold water in my face, which would be needed in this form room right now. <laughs> um, I began truly teaching last summer at Scarlet Middle School um, at the Summer Learning Institute. Yep. Uh, 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 having a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with students um, early on helped me realize the secret of teaching um, that should be about as obvious as the Red Wings going to the playoffs. Building a genuine connection with the students will help them achieve. Making them believe that you and genuinely care about them and their success in school will help them be motivated within and without school. Um, so, uh, then I, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit to my teaching at John Glenn High School um, in Westland, Michigan, uh, which is near Detroit. Um, so facing 11th graders, one of my first problems was actually differentiating myself from them. <laughs> the, uh, the tie didn't always help. I cursed my youth. Um, yes. So yeah, I, I tended to yeah, not, not shave. Purposely for that reason. Um, so I saw how often that they didn't connect different units with each other. Um, providing continuity within the curriculum and connecting what we were studying to their lives um, became a goal. As we studied World War II, um, one of my students' um, grandmothers actually um, served the war front. Um, sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, helped serve the war um, on the home front. Um, by building um, B B-24 bombers in the Willow Run plant, 
Willow Run plant, um, which if you are familiar with, it's right next to Detroit. Um, so that, so kind of seeing that spark and that familial connection helped pique his interest in this. Um, so I'll pause here uh, to explain what I mean by each of these terms. And these are the terms that I kind of have chosen as my personal foci uh, for my profession as a teacher. So when I mean compassion, you not only need to um, demonstrate, you not only need to feel um, a sense of empathy with your students and a genuine concern about them, you need to demonstrate that to them. Um, let's see, uh, a student-centered education, uh, second one, uh, encompasses a, a variety of different meanings, but it essentially shifts the focus of, of instruct, uh, sorry, shifts the focus of instruction um, from the teacher to the students. Teachers are, uh, students are asked to be more autonomous. They're asked to um, construct meaning out of um, the different materials that we're working on. Um, the onus to learn is put on them and they have to do the cognitive work. And through that cognitive work, they have much deeper understanding and that understanding will last much longer. This will be the, uh, the, the lessons that they remember decades later. Um, now differentiation begins by realizing that students have, shockingly, different experiences different uh, cultural values, different cultural experiences, um, skill levels, etc. Students are unique, that's the best way to put it. Um, so treating an education um, as a one size fits all is a terrible model if all students are unique. So to the best, uh, to the best degree possible to, pr pr to promote equity or the kind of equal access for opportunity for students, you need to differentiate um, kind of by content, um, by assessment, by, pro uh, by process, and by learning environment. So I began practicing these core uh, pedagogical beliefs at John Glenn, and I refined them at Scarlet Middle School um, with Mr. Ian Chen. Um, when I began teaching at Scarlet Middle School, uh, again, uh, for seventh grade world history and eighth grade um, US history, I encountered a whole new set of challenges. These kids were loud <laughs> and very passionate. Anyone uh, teaching uh, at middle school uh, can kind of sense that. Um, high schoolers, uh, the problem often was a little bit more of uh, apathy. <laughs> um, but they, much like my high students, often fail to see the relevance to, from the material that we were looking at to their own lives. And, or even the rationale for studying the material. You know, what did it matter to them? So finding a way to connect different um, subjects with each other and to engage students became a central foci for my instruction. Um, now, I'm gonna give you some concrete examples of how I actually have demonstrated this. Um, so one example of compassion is, um, all of these names are pseudonyms. Um, talking with the student, Mark, um, outside of the class, um, he um, you know, was, was sent out for kind of um, misbehaving and always kind of talking out of turn. Um, so I, I went outside um, of the classroom and I gave him some strategies and I had to track him, <laughs> track him down. He wouldn't, he, he kept going to the office and I, I had to say, Mark, stop. All right, all right, let's talk about this. And I gave him um, some tools that I had used um, and, as my, you know, personally, that I've learned um, through karate and through uh, meditation, to kind of, um, you know, you know, breathe in, uh, breathe in through the nose, breathe out through the mouth, take deep breaths, you know, close your eyes, um, other tools to kind of avoid distractions within the classroom because that's what Mark always suffered from. He would be distracted by other students and then he would, you know, he would laugh or say something funny. You know, so I gave him some other ideas like maybe moving yourself to the front of the classroom or to other spots where you're not going to encounter these, you know, these same problems. Um, and Mark actually took that to heart. And even though it's still a work in progress, uh, he, uh, you know, he has become better. Um, and I'm proud of that. Another example of my compassion, uh, talking to the student Brody um, about his girlfriend issues, um, some issues at home. Um, 
and helping him one-on-one -on -one with his Democracy Myth project. And I'm gonna uh, give a little brief de uh, description of that. Um, the de Democracy Myth project that I created for these seventh graders, they had to um, create a myth, uh, you know, um, kind of in line with, they, with what they were studying in English, um, which is um, Greek mythology. So they had to create a myth explaining how democracy arose. I'm gonna get into that a little bit more later. Um, a third example um, demonstrating my compassion is with the student, Alan, who was rather quiet in class. I picked up something was wrong, even though he was normally rather quiet. Um, so I offered him some dried mangoes uh, in my backpack. Uh, I was gonna have them as a prop. Um, but shock, shock, shockingly, uh, the use of food with students is highly effective. I would <laughs> recommend uh, bribing students with treats as much as possible. Um, but you know, I said, here, uh, let's just, I gave him the bag of dried mangoes, let's walk around the hallway, let's talk about this. Um, and you know, in, in talking about this, we, uh, I realized that he um, had been kind of unfairly discriminated against in another classroom for um, some bad behavior that wasn't really his fault. Um, so I actually followed up, you know, I advocated for him, to use a pedagogical term, uh, you know, and I went to his guidance counselor and, um, and I told her about it, and I helped correct the, the situation. Um, and he, you know, he didn't, you know, he said thank you, um, but he was, he was more motivated in class in the future. Um, so, let's see here. Um, Really quick, uh, last example I'm gonna use for compassion. Um, I noticed a student, Emily, um, was distressed one class. Um, she normally was rather quiet. Um, but I noticed something was wrong, and I took her to the guidance counselor, and um, I sat with her um, You know, after um, getting another um, teacher to facilitate um, the test that was being given out for the rest of the class, um, and I, um, you know, kind of heard her um, personal story uh, of abuse and of self-harm. Um, and I followed up with her you know, every single day, and I helped her actively um, you know, not self-harm and channel that into a positive outlet, a short story that she was writing on and that I was helping uh, critique. Um, so an example of how I differentiate and promote equity and adopt a student-centered approach, so, Three, three and one, crazy, democracy myth project. So I already talked a little bit about this, but what you guys don't know is that students were given pretty much complete leeway in the creation of the myth. They didn't have to just write it down in the form of a short story. They could create a video. They could create a digital storybook. Um, I actually made one, um, it's rather, rather silly, um, to, to, to describe you know, what they could do. And students really flourished at this student choice. And that student choice is really important. When students have a choice in what they do and how they're assessed, they're much more motivated to actually engage in the material. Um, so another example of how I differentiate, um, okay. uh, as well as adopt a student-centered approach, um, I'll call this the El Chapo story. <laughs> um, so several um, English language learner students in one hour uh, who would quite literally say El Chapo every single class, um, Mr. Shepard can back me up on that, uh, <laughs> weren't really engaging in the democracy myth project. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to cater to you and I'm going to make a project specifically for you guys. So I want you to think about, so guys, do you, so I, I asked them, guys, do you like this project? Eh. Well, how would you guys like to uh, do a project about El Chapo? Woo! <laughs> Response. Um, but I, stipula I stipulated that they had to meet the same criteria that the um, rest of the, the project um, was, where they had to talk about the four different types of government, um, oligarchy, um, monarchy, uh, democracy, and tyranny. And they had to decide what style of government El Chapo would favor, and they'd have to explained this, and, and they actually um, explained it quite well. And we got into kind of the, uh, you know, like the definition of a, you know, the, car the cartel, seeing the little cartel. Um, 
So, yeah, so the last example um, I'm going to use of my differentiation and student-centered approach um, is my Manifest Destiny and Westward Expansion project. So the idea of Manifest Destiny is that um, uh, it is our God-given right to expand from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, um, westward, and that justified our ex uh, westward expansion in the 1800s. So, um, so normally it's, uh, this chapter would be divided up into basically the different territorial acquisitions during this time. So instead of doing that, I divided it up into each territory um, would be assigned to, e e sorry, a group of six students would be assigned to each territory. And within those um, groups, they could pick their role. One person would be arguing for the expansion, one person would be arguing against, um, one per person would be a cartographer, um, et cetera. Um, but one comment to my student on the second day of this project, she said, Mr. T, this is the best project we've done all year. Uh, and this quote and the high performance across the board on the chapter test encapsulates why creating a student-centered classroom that forces students to be in the driver's seat and differentiating the class, um, instructional techniques, assessments, and like promotes equity. Students who have a choice in their education are much more willing to learn. Um, and if they're willing to learn, they will they can actually reach their full potential. And that's what I want to do in the future. Thank you for your time. <laughs> any questions? Yes. So does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Kevin. Yeah. Kevin, what are you looking forward to most now in your sort of first teaching job? Um, and it sounds it sounds weird, but like encountering new problems. <laughs> so I'll I'll be um, teaching um, in a more rural setting. Um, so kind of seeing, you know, I was in a, both um, John Glenn High School and um, Scarlet were very um, diverse, um, and the school down in Florida where I will be teaching will be diverse as well, um, but in a more kind of rural capacity as per, as opposed to urban. Um, so it'll be kind of interesting to see um, these different, um, you know, difficulties. Um, and you know, you know, as I face these different difficulties, as I've learned through this MAC program, you get better and better at facing them and overcoming them. So by you know facing different sets of challenges, I think I'll continue to improve as a teacher, and that's really what I, I want to do. Um. So I'm really interested, you were one of the few people who had an experience at a high school and a middle school. Um, what was your biggest, what's the biggest difference? You kind of alluded to more apathy. Um, is there anything else? Yeah, so probably the biggest difference was in high school, getting the students to lift their heads up off the desk. Um, <laughs> the middle schoolers, to put it succinctly, uh, middle schoolers was to get them to get up off their desk and sit down. <laughs> so the energy level, uh, yeah. So uh, that was probably the most pa uh, pa uh, palpable uh, difference. Um, but still, kind of, you know, the, the continuous string of how does this actually affect me, um, you know, existed from middle school and through high school, and I think that probably exists in elementary school. But none of us here <laughs> really have experience of that. Okay. To the best of my knowledge. We have time for one more question. If anyone has one. What advice do you have for new teachers? Uh, Seeing that you come out of this excellent yeah. program. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Um, collaborate as much as possible. Um, I would not be the teacher that I am. Um, beginning teacher that I am today um, without learning from both my peers and um, my mentors, um, from other teachers in the building, um, not just within your subject area, but from other disciplines. Um, so, you know, talking with, you know, other English teachers um, who, who said, hey, we're studying ancient Greek mythology, that got me thinking, hey, why don't we create this project um, where they create a myth in a slightly different way. 
Um, so definitely um, collab. Not to piggyback too much on Kevin, but so I had lunch every day with two you know, English teachers and one social studies teacher, and I teach math. And just, so just giving the opportunity to see students in a different light from their perspectives as opposed to our perspective in a math class, um, it lets you see them in an area where they might struggle in math, but they're really successful in English, um, or they're really successful in social studies, and so you can see students in a different light. And so that's a habit. Definitely. Definitely. So, so that's all the time we have. Um, so on the collect feedback forms, and this is the last session, so I'm going to remind you that we are returning to Proctor to hear Andy speak. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 we're going to hear Dr. Hart speak again, and we have dessert. Okay. <laughs> that's some motivation. <laughs> See? <laughs> Food. <laughs> so give another round of applause to Kevin. Yay. Thank you. Thank you.